Well, good day, Lionhearts. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. I'm doing well. Today, I want to go do an old Hollywood story. As you know, um, I'm friends with Todd Fisher and Katherine Hicklin, and Todd Fisher was the son of Debbie Reynolds and the brother of Carrie Fisher. And I've been reading his book, and there was a couple of stories that I thought was a very interesting time in Debbie's life that I actually didn't know about. And when I kind of was listening, I got the audiobook so I could hear Todd tell the stories. He really tells this impassioned description of what the house on Greenway Drive was like. And I have vlogged a lot of um, that house before, but today I want to start there and tell you why they ended up moving there and what insane thing happened on moving day. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Take a look at that happy face. How you doing today, Ja? You've already been to the park and you've already eaten and you're just taking life as it comes, aren't you? Getting ready to move, aren't you? And today's special Patreon sunglass vlog will be for Vianne Smith. Vianne, I hope you're a Debbie Reynolds, Carrie Fisher, and Todd Fisher fan. This is gonna be a doozy today. We're at 813 Greenway Drive, and this is really Carrie Fisher and Todd Fisher's main childhood home growing up. This is where they had all of their memories. As you may know, uh, Debbie Reynolds was with Eddie Fisher originally, and uh, had two children, Carrie Fisher and Todd Fisher, and then um, she ended up losing Eddie to Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor and Eddie Fisher were friends. Well, the whole, both families, Mike Todd, Elizabeth Taylor's husband, and, um, and Eddie were great friends. Then when Mike Todd passed away, Eddie was there to console her and they fell in love. And so when Debbie went on with her life after, this was the home that they all moved into, 813 Greenway. And Debbie remarried a man named Harry Carl, and Harry Carl owned a shoe company called Carl Shoes. Now to hear Todd Fisher describe growing up here, he literally in his book describes it the way that Scarlett describes Tara. This was just a wonderland. This was a massive, massive property. They had a full staff that kept it going, including a security guard and cooks and maids and Todd and Carrie had tutors and they had this, you know, this extravagant lifestyle. And Harry Carl, being this, uh, the owner of this shoe company, he was very independently wealthy. When he married Debbie, he came into the marriage with $21 million. And so most of his days, um, he was very, very much a socialite. He didn't go to work. He would go to the Friars Club. He would go play golf. He would go gamble. He would drink and that was his life. And Debbie basically was okay with it because she said, Harry has his own money, Harry can do what he wants. Now Todd said this was just such an unbelievable place because they had so much land here that when MGM closed down and Debbie wanted to buy all of the memorabilia, she bought most of it or everything that she could. And since he had an interest in making his own movies, he had talked her into getting him his first film camera. Uh, he moved the Western set from MGM out here onto the grounds here. And when they used to have tour buses that would come around here because Debbie was living here, Todd would take it upon himself with his friends to come out and stage war reenactments in the street for the tour buses and including doing some uh, detonations they had what he didn't realize at the time were they had gotten their hands on quarter sticks of dynamite and had blown part of the house up here um, during one of their little filming escapades. And he also got to have a pet alligator here. He eventually, with Harry Carl, Harry was a kind of a gambler, well, not kind of, he was definitely a gambler. Harry used to take Todd out golfing with him and then they would gamble with people on the course. And one time, Todd hit a, you know, this unbelievable shot. Harry won the money and said, Todd, you can have anything you want. And Todd wanted to go to the surplus store and they went to this surplus store and there was a, honest to God, a full World War II tank sitting outside. And Todd said, how about that? Can I have that? And so he got the tank and that created some problems because when they got the tank back here, Debbie saw it, she totally flipped out. And then Todd accidentally said, oh, don't worry, mom. We won this playing golf. We didn't even have to pay for it. 
So Debbie realized that, you know, Todd and Harry and what Harry's lifestyle was, was probably not the greatest thing. So at one point while living here, the FBI came and visited Debbie Reynolds. And Debbie said that they talked to her about Harry's gambling. They said that there had been a Friars Club um, controversy where someone was hiding above the room where everybody played cards and was um, digitally sending uh, to someone at the table what other people had. There was a peephole up there and Harry wasn't involved in it but he had lost money due to it and they were saying, telling to, telling Debbie how much he was losing. He was losing $32,000 a day and had been gambling for years. So this ends up becoming a problem. Even though Debbie says that's fine, that's his money and that's the way Harry always saw it, she would later come to find out that uh, it wasn't necessarily his money. They had gambled away or mortgaged away almost everything Debbie had earned while living in this house for 10 years. Almost $10 million. In fact, this was such a wonderland. If they didn't have to move, they probably never would have moved from here. Let me tell you what happened and why they ended up having to move. So Debbie had referred a friend of hers, Rod Taylor, to her business manager, who was good friends with Harry Carl. And when the business manager met with Rod, Rod came back to Debbie and said, I can't believe you would do business with that guy. I would never give away 25% of my income to a business manager. And Debbie had no idea what he was talking about. He said, Debbie, everything that you make, this guy's taking 25%. So she started having people look into the books and found out that, boy, was it a mess. She had signed away power of attorney uh, to not only Harry, but his secretary, someone down at the bank, and her business manager. So they were all signing things on her behalf, taking out mortgages, putting her money in different avenues. In fact, uh, one of the things she was most proud of was saving that MGM collection and she had tons of money to buy it. But when they went to pay for it, Harry told her, oh no, you have to do a $160,000 loan because the money that we need to, to do that is actually tied up in other investments. And so Debbie didn't even rightfully own that. So. Basically, when she started looking into this, she saw that things that she, she, she had a hospital that she had paid for that her business manager actually owned. Her car, her business manager owned. This house would end up being taken away because of Harry Carl's business deals, having this involved into the mortgage and Debbie being married to Harry at the same time made her responsible for all of his debt. So Debbie would spend years and years trying to dig out of this. In fact, the way that she was able to keep the MGM collection was she went to perform in Vegas and made all that money in Vegas so that she could pay off that loan and keep that. So when it all came down to it, she decided to obviously divorce Harry Carl and when they went through everything, everything that he had had pretty much been mortgaged away other than his business. And everything that she had now was gonna be taken away. Her cars, all of her homes that she built. She had a Malibu house that she had built herself. And, um, and they, they were threatening to take that away. They actually ended up not being able to because there was no mortgage on it. But anything that she had a mortgage on at all was taken. Now this house was part of that deal because when Harry sold Carl's shoes, um, his outstanding debts with them, even after what he made, was just too much for for what he could afford. And so the uh, the lender that he had went through, since he had owned the shoe company, he was basically borrowing, um, using his shoe company as collateral. Once they called that in, they told Debbie that she and her family would have to move away from Greenway Drive, this house, um, at the time that it would be sold. Now they could continue living here until it was sold, which they would get to do for quite a while, but that would then make Debbie have to start looking for a place for them to rent because when she had settled with the business manager, she had only gotten $300,000 out of him. And Harry Carl ended up using that saying, oh, I need that to mortgage a, a business deal. And really what he was doing was he had already used that as collateral for another 
loan and they were calling that in so they had nothing she had to use what little she had she was performing on Broadway in New York making fifteen thousand dollars so she got an accounting firm to take over her finance situation to help get her back under control and then the person responsible for her account ended up stealing hundred and sixty thousand dollars and when Debbie went to the business and told them that it had been taken they didn't want to believe her she had to hire her own investigators and eventually an insurance company company for that accounting firm ended up paying her back so she just had such a tumultuous time but all of a sudden one day they get notification that you have to move away from Greenway you have three days to vacate because the house has been sold so now we're gonna go over to where they moved it was also in Beverly Hills and Debbie's car she had this custom green emerald green uh, Mercedes-Benz that had been gifted to her they took that away and then eventually Harry bought it back for eight thousand dollars and then sold it again for eighteen thousand dollars and in fact one day Debbie came home before she divorced Harry when she was separating him and went to put on some of her jewelry and found out that he had went through their safe and took all of her expensive jewels the only thing that she had was what she had put in her purse uh, at a previous time and he had said you know when she went and said what happened to all my jewels he said well I had to sell them we needed the money so even though Debbie didn't have all that much money she wanted to rent another house in Beverly Hills and the reason that was was because Todd was still in high school and she wanted him to get to graduate from Beverly Hills High that's where he'd went that's where all of his friends were and in fact a funny story about living here um, he got his license while he was living here and she had even though she was in debt she wanted to spoil her kids so she had a Mercedes and a Porsche brought out and said which one do you want for your first car and he said neither I want an RV and so <laughs> she negotiated a deal with an RV company and took him and they picked out an RV and uh, they would I believe that they just went out uh, the RV company got to go out and like photograph them using it or whatever and then Todd would drive that to high school and told his mom the reason that he really thought it was a great idea is because hey we're about to lose the house and you never know what will happen I'll always have a place to live <laughs> there you can see just a little bit of the driveway Todd tells in his book that when the alligator became too big that they told the head of security to get rid of it and all of a sudden one day it was gone and then there was a report of an alligator living over at the golf course right on the other side of the fence from this house <laughs> that he had just put it over the wall and let it go live in the lake there so here's a little bit of the fence here a little further up past their house but if you look on the other side you can see some golfers out there right now as a matter of fact Now Debbie worked insanely hard trying to dig her way out of this hole that she didn't create but she just a lot of those financial things were so over her head she just trusted other people to to run them and then ended up paying for it later and Carrie would even say that Debbie worked her way through a, a breakdown a life breakdown now out here on this quiet Beverly Hill Street is where Debbie moved the family to if you can believe it when she got the divorce from Harry he got alimony and she had to pay for his condo in Century City and his golf membership and all that stuff they moved into this house and she didn't like it it was much smaller and she said that it was dark and drab and immediately wanted to paint it and put wallpaper up but what happened here was they were they had three days to vacate the Greenway house as you know so they were moving everything over putting a lot in storage because of how much space they had over there they had to and moving a lot of the boxes over here so Todd and Debbie's head of security Zinc had taken the truck over to the Greenway house that we just left and Debbie was here unloading her car taking some costumes out she walked up to the front door and apparently a well-dressed man came up behind her and pointed a gun at her forehead now just as this happened her friend Bob Fallon showed up parked his car and walked up and said what's going on here and Debbie actually thought that this was a prank she thought that because you know she's just moving in somebody was pranking her and someone had sent them to do this and actually said that like who sent you here to do this and uh, and the guy said you know 
get in the house, pointed the gun at both Bob and Debbie Reynolds both, and then told them to get in the house. And as they went in, another accomplice of his with a bigger gun, as she described, went inside, followed them in, and took them into the front hallway. Debbie's housekeeper, Mary, came around the corner, saw what was happening, and dropped to the ground, covered her face, and said, I didn't see anything. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. And one of the people with the gun, the first one that had pointed the gun at Debbie and had taken her in, Debbie still thought this was a prank at first. Um, he looked at Mary and said, don't worry, sister, we're not going to kill you, and then immediately darted his eyes over to Debbie, and she got very scared because she knew at this point that they planned on killing her. She had seen their face. So they immediately started looking for money, asking for money, and Debbie said, we're moving in. We don't have anything here. There's nothing here. And uh, he said, this is a rich neighborhood, and you're rich people, so we know you have something. Give us something. And so Mary had like $150 that Debbie had given her for groceries, and Bob had about $100, and they gave it to him. And then they start looking around the house for jewelry, and they eventually come downstairs while Bob, Mary, and... Debbie are on their knees in the living room with guns pointed at them. Uh, the other man comes down with a box of costume jewelry of Debbie's and says, look what I found. And Debbie said, you don't want that. That's just my costume jewelry. She said she would wear it when she would do impressions of Mae West or Zsa Zsa Gabor and um, said that they first didn't believe her, but then kind of were starting to believe her. And she said, and then they asked her to empty out her purse and she dumped out all the contents of her purse, which actually had that little bit of real jewelry left that she still had that the bank and Harry hadn't gotten from her. And uh, they said, let me guess, that's costume jewelry also. And she said, I'm afraid so. And they actually believed her and didn't take it. So they eventually ransacked the house looking for money and anything of value. And then in a little bathroom underneath the stairwell in the front hall here, they opened the door and told all three to go inside there. And Debbie said they for sure thought that they were gonna be shot as soon as they went into the bathroom. But the men closed the door and Debbie said the three of them in that bathroom immediately scattered, like grabbed a wall in this tight little bathroom hoping that if they fired that maybe they were close enough to a wall that it would avoid them or something. And they said then they waited a few minutes and no gunshots ever went off. And then they waited, you know, 20 or 30 minutes and nothing, they didn't hear anything. They were afraid to leave that bathroom. And then they said, after about an hour, they finally really, really carefully opened that door to see that the men had left. And they called the police. And then in Todd's book, he says, when we arrived back with another load of stuff to unload, we saw a whole fleet of police cars out here. And of course, you know, they said that her bodyguard Zink was really upset because he, he felt like he should have been here to protect her for something like that. But Debbie actually said, you know, with the other men having a gun and that Zink carried a gun, that she figured, you know, it was probably played out the best way it could because it would have really gotten out of hand if, uh, if he would have been here. So what a welcome to the neighborhood, huh? This was, uh, when they moved here, Carrie wasn't even living with them at the time. She was in school in London and was so mad. She had been accepted at this school and then decided she didn't want to go. And Debbie said, you have a real talent. They accepted you, you're going, you don't have a choice. And they fought about it and fought about it. And then Carrie had to go. So Carrie went, but her retaliation was that she decided not to talk to Debbie. If Debbie would call, she would ignore it. Um, she would run up massive bills, basically trying to spend her to death. And, um, and it was during this time when they moved here that Carrie had come back from school and was living at the apartment in New York that Debbie had because Debbie had just wrapped up her Broadway engagement of Irene and was gonna be moving back out here for a permanent basis. Poor Debbie Reynolds, it's kind of heartbreaking to hear all the stuff that she went through and that out of everything that she had, she lost it all except for the Hollywood memorabilia. That's really the only thing she got to keep. And then her first two or three days of moving in here, I think it was on day three when they were moving in here, the, she gets robbed. It's interesting, Todd said when they moved here, all of their neighbors were famous. He said right next door was Shirley Jones and she was, you know, her stepkids were David and Leif Cassidy. So pretty famous neighborhood to 
move into from the one you were already living in. And I believe Shirley Jones still lives on this street. Well, I guess since we're here, let me look up her address and we'll see what Shirley Jones' house looks like. Yeah, so it looks like Shirley's house is right up here on the corner. 700 block. That's it right there, that blue house. Shirley Jones' house. For many, many years. Apparently when she lived with Jack Cassidy, they lived there. And then, of course, she was married to Marty Ingalls for many years, who passed away a couple of years ago. I met her and Marty at my friend Shelly Winter's birthday party many years ago. I think it was her 83rd birthday party. Shirley and Marty came and Marty had brought birthday shirts that he had made of Shelly. Fun times. A couple of interesting little tidbits about Carrie when she did move into the Oakhurst house. Debbie gave her Marlon Brando's bed from when he played Napoleon and she liked it so much that she used it for the rest of her life. It was her Desiree bed. And Debbie used a little bit of the money she did have to buy the monkey business car from Cary Grant and Marilyn Monroe's monkey business movie, and that became Cary's car. Gotta take John out of the dog park for a little bit. Round off the day. can investigate it together. Kind of knew that was coming. I kind of like coming to this park for that reason so you can see the plains land. How you doing? Are you happy? You look pretty happy. He's so happy a bunch of dogs just showed up. All right, my friends, we're gonna call it a day. If you didn't know much about that part of Debbie Reynolds' life, I hope you enjoyed today's vlog. What a shocker, huh? Thank you, Rhett Hinty Patchett, for becoming my newest Patreon. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Jennifer Coyle. And we'll see you all next time. Have a great night, and goodbye.